Uh, for our final uh, facilitated discussion, we bring up uh, to the stage Dr. Richard Kuhn. Dr. Kuhn is the director of Purdue's Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease, and has been involved in many fundamental studies examining the structure and assembly of envelope viruses, including the first structure of the dengue, dengue virus. And I believe, um, based on what's been told to me, I think he sits on virtually every virus-related journal there is across the globe. So very uh, knowledgeable in the subjects that are relevant here in both these discussions. So thank you for facilitating this Q&A. And please uh, think of your questions and ask them. Thank you. So as moderator, um, I think I will take my advantage and, and ask the first question. Um, I'm very passionate about. Uh, uh, global health and, and certainly infectious disease. And I think most Americans are also. Um, but there is right now a kind of a discussion in Washington about you know, not providing the same level of foreign aid. And if you look at foreign aid to, to countries, a very significant amount of that is, is for global health. Um, could each of you talk about what the respective roles of the government of non-government organizations, universities, businesses, other entities in terms of improving global health? Wow. Sorry. <laughs> is, is this, again, I'll say it. Ladies first, age yeah, before beauty, or what yeah. is this? Um, I, I, I'm happy to give, give it a go. Um, I think that well, the simple answer is we all have a role to play. Um, and it's figuring out what, what our role should be and where we want to contribute because there are so many problems to solve. There are plenty to go around. Um, and I think it, you mentioned the, you know, the U.S. government's role, and I think that there are both humanitarian and pragmatic reasons to invest in global health. The humanitarian reason being uh, probably obvious to all of us that, that um, reducing uh, suffering from diseases should be a common human goal. But I think even from a pragmatic perspective, um, in infectious diseases, we are all linked. Our fates are linked in terms of transmission of disease and, and what we can do to prevent. So it's within our own best interest to control those diseases where they occur from a pragmatic perspective. Yeah, I would certainly agree that there is a moral imperative. We have a moral imperative as human beings uh, to uh, reach out uh, beyond our own borders. Uh, so uh, certainly no question about that. Uh, as well, uh, I think most of us would agree uh, that where um, there's division, uh, where there is uh, unrest, much of this, of course, uh, caused by uh, the social determinants uh, that I talked about, uh, poverty, uh, disparity, uh, gender disparity, et cetera. I think that we as a country uh, wishing to protect our own uh, borders uh, need to be attentive to what's happening outside of our borders. Uh, if we think right now uh, by not helping, for example, the Rohingya uh, in um, your neighbor. That's right. Uh, there's a problem right there that's going to uh, manifest itself uh, years down the line. Uh, and we're, we'll eventually have to deal with it as a national security uh, a problem. Beyond that, of course, there are lessons to be learned, not just in an infectious disease in terms of, uh, of preventing, for example, Ebola crisis from coming into our borders, across our borders, but as well, uh, as I illustrated with uh, community health workers, uh, there's a wealth of knowledge to be gained by working outside our borders that can be brought back into our own country and will make our country uh, so much better than what it is currently. Great. Absolutely. Sorry to sorry to throw a, maybe a hardball at you right mm. off the bat. So, do we have questions from the from the audience? Yes. Go ahead. First of all, you're both extremely amazing people for for being so unselfish uh, to do what you've done. Thank you for that. I'm curious. While we've been sitting here this morning, Indiana University has announced that it's going to devote 50 million dollars to the opioid epidemic. 
if if each of you were talking to the governor of Indiana, what would be the one thing you would say to do to try to interrupt that cycle? Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to do it from top down, uh, and you're not going to do it from the outside. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, if you will, theologians and philosophers, uh, uh, Richard Rohr, uh, says that uh, to change systems, uh, to unlock systems, you do it from the inside. And if you want lasting change, it's going to have to come from the inside. So anything that is short of working at community level uh, and, um, and, and working within uh, communities led by uh, the opinion leaders and the leaders at the community level uh, will, not, will fail. It will fail. So one must, must work at that level. My, my plea would be for data-driven policies. We all have preconceived notions and our own prejudices, and this is a time to check all of those at the door and really focus on public health prevention, which should be data-driven. So whatever is going to work to prevent those infections is the path that you should take. Um, and that's often a difficulty that we have in public health, but here it will be particularly important. I wouldn't be afraid to work, uh, to, to risk, though, uh, without the data. I think uh, sometimes you have to make that leap. Uh, we don't have time right now, given the, uh, given the gravity of the opioid epidemic that we as a state and we as a country are facing right now, to wait for all the data to come in. And I'm not suggesting that we don't want data. Of course we do. Mm -hmm. We want to create a system that enables us to collect that data and to allow us to uh, understand what we're doing as we're doing it so that we can redirect as, as needed. Um, but uh, we need some uh, innovative ideas, and those ideas uh, largely will not have a medical, uh, a, a med medical solution here. So I have a question, a uh, Twitter question, and that is how can global life science companies, but let's, let's just focus right now here on our folks here in Indiana, how can they help uh, how can you be engaged with them? How can we push their technologies out to the field, if you will? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it occurring well now? What can be improved? Well, I think for, uh, the, for, for the companies, the global companies, to, if you will, push their technology out into the field is probably the wrong way to look at it. I think one needs to look at how can the global companies be engaged in the field, understand what's going on in the field, and then understand what technologies are most appropriate uh, in the field, and then work from it uh, in that direction. Uh, I, I, I agree. I, I think there are some wonderful technologies out there that solve problems that we don't necessarily have. And so the, the, the better a job we can do at aligning technologies um, with those problems, I think it's not, it becomes then not an issue of pushing the technologies out, but there'll be a great pull to get them to the field if they really are solving the problems in a way that's useful. Yeah, let me just say that the institute that we formed at Purdue, that I'm the director of, it's really about bringing engineers together with medicinal chemists, together with life scientists mm -hmm. and clinicians, people in the field, so that the engineers don't simply design because they can design, but they design based on the need. So, That's absolutely what's needed. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's one of the reasons I uh, said the quote that I said at the end there uh, as well, where that one gentleman talked about how it, it took multiple individuals from multiple components of the, of the company to come together to really understand how to translate research into action. And... Um, yeah, it's multidisciplinary approach across, uh, across sectors, uh, in, in essence, the definition of global health. Yeah. So, Bob, you mentioned that uh, there were Lilly folks who went over to Kenya. Um, was that part of this experience in terms of understanding, um, you know, what's, what's the problems over there and how could a company like Lilly, for example, um, well, of course, I think you'd have to speak to the Lilly uh, uh, management to understand uh, what their motivation is. But from my perspective, I think it is a wonderful opportunity for the company itself to begin to understand how does one do business in a place like Kenya. Yeah. Uh, clearly very, uh, very different uh, in some ways uh, than doing business in the United States. And for uh, the middle level leadership or junior leadership uh, at Lilly to have an experience working in a place like Bangladesh, a place like Kenya, uh, uh, is the very first step, I think, to becoming a successful global company. 
I'm not a global company, so what I said could be all wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that um, that, that, that has uh, benefited, uh, benefited uh, the company, has potential to benefit the company in terms of leadership, and certainly uh, at an individual level, as I spoke. Um, this is not a question of us doing this to them. It is a partnership where we work together for common good and common cause. Emily, a question from the audience is, uh, what is the prevalence of hepatitis E worldwide? Is it, is it simply in, in countries such as Bangladesh where the, the hygiene is less than ideal, or uh, is that a concern across the globe? Good question, and one we don't have a good answer for, frankly, because the diagnostic tests that we've used over the years haven't been very good. So the data that we do have aren't very good, but there are four genotypes that I mentioned. So genotypes one and two are spread through um, contaminated water and food. Genotypes three and four are zoonotic infections. So the virus infects animals uh, easily and then is transmitted to people when they eat undercooked pork, for example. So there are small areas of uh, hyperendemic transmission in Europe from genotype three. So in the United States, if you do population-based seroprevalence studies, probably around 10% of people have been infected with hepatitis E. But where and when they were infected, we don't know. And what genotype it was, we don't know. Yes. Chris Badero, Eli Lilly and Company. Um, just a quick comment on our Connected Currents Abroad program. We um, do that around the world. There are about 20 different centers where employees can go and work in disadvantaged areas to learn about what's happening there and try to help out in some way, some small way. Um, question was, you know, we've talked about the impact that government can have and private corporations. Could you comment on the comment of large private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others, there are many, um, in terms of actually addressing some of these uh, big, critical global health issues? They play a huge role, <laughs> an increasingly important role um, in funding these big ideas. Um, Comment more on their role. I think <laughs> what, one of the, um, they play, of course, a critical role in both uh, funding um, innovators and entrepreneurs at a, at a relatively focused level. Uh, they can't take on systems. They don't, they, even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, doesn't have the wealth to take on systems as such. Only the government, United States and other governments working together, have the capacity, uh, the deep pockets to take on systems. But in terms of helping to understand where uh, the next step should be, what the next new discovery can be to help the system as a whole, they play a crit critical role. They're opinion leaders and opinion makers uh, as well, and uh, highly respected, uh, as, as, and I don't need to tell this audience that. One point I would uh, like to make, though, is, and it gets back to your question, uh, and I know I'll step on some toes here, and my apologies if, if your uh, little toe hurts after this one. but. Um, NGOs play an important role uh, at a certain level, but NGOs in general, in general, not all of them, but in general, don't take on systems. It's only governments, it's only the governments that really take on uh, systems. And, and, and for a health system to work, it needs that central nervous system. It needs, that, it, it needs to all be connected. Uh, the right hand needs to know what the left hand's doing. The foot needs to go with the, know what the mouth is doing. Um, and to be working in the public sector, uh, I would contend, in the long run, is the way that one changes the health outcomes in a place uh, like uh, Kenya. Agree. Yeah. I, I would just add, though, about foundations, a, a role that they can play is in investing in something new that might fail. You know, NIH doesn't like to fund studies that really might fail. Um, <laughs> scientists are like entrepreneurs. We have to raise money for our work and convince people to invest in us. And, and so, you know, foundations and also industry are more risk takers. And so there's an important innovation aspect there. Although 
clearly they're not getting at the systems issue. But, yeah. but likewise with our yeah. program, yeah. Um, the big money comes from PEPFAR, right? President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief uh, for much of what we have done in HIV in this bipartisan initiative. But to, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative, to try something a little bit new, this is where foundations and money come from, from foundations or private philanthropy of any sort, be it an individual or foundation, makes a huge difference. So the flexibility that comes with that, I mean, and again, this is in the business world, we need the capital to invest, to be able to take the risk, and just as you say, may fall flat on its face. Yeah. Let me just say, and, and I'm biased since I work at a university, that universities are somewhat poised if they have the resources, people resources, financial resources, to really impact in a holistic way global health. I mean, you talked about it, Bob, when you were talking about empath. It's not simply the medical pieces that need to go into place. There's a huge number of engineering, agricultural pieces that go into place. This is what American universities are great at. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, were, we have this land grant system established back in the 1800s. We have great medical centers. When you could put those together in a coordinated way, mm -hmm. and in a, in a very focused way, you can make a local difference. The, the key there, of course, is if or when you can put them together. I mean, because universities are so siloed. Uh, yet, what you say is exactly right. Across the spectrum, uh, we have such wealth, such b wealth of intellectual resource uh, to get, you know, HIV crisis. I need a journalist to tell the world. I need a lawyer to uh, discuss women's rights, uh, to address the issue of w women's rights. I mean, every school within Indiana University every major school like, has played a role, as have multiple other universities. But the trick is, how do you get them all to work together? And the way we're funded right now, particularly the way research is funded in, in the United States, it tends to be this project, that project, and you compete with my right. institution, and I compete with your institution. And that's a, that's, that's a challenge. And even competition within institutions. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think the other, but the other niche that those universities can fill is in training and bringing up you know, right. uh, folks and, and, and having the cultural exchange that you can also do with training that's really unique. Yeah. So another question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so question, uh, probably more for Bob, but uh, I think it's relevant in the answer for both of you. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about it in your talk, Bob, about the, the fact that your, say your AMPATH EMR system was now being spread to other countries around the world and that sort of thing. Take that a step further with, if you would, into other broader lessons learned, other pieces of, of what you've learned at, in Kenya over the years. How much of that has been, or is able to bring back actually to help here in the United States with areas of our country that are you know, equally in need of, of some support some, uh, around the, not just the delivery of healthcare, but the broader uh, aspect of health and wellness. Think about some of the parts of the rural Rural America, uh, desperate need for some coordination of care there and some coordination of effort. Yeah, well, if one looks at the uh, HIV outbreak in Scott County just a couple of years ago, it was some of the lessons that we learned in Kenya yeah. that, in fact, we, uh, we applied then, not me at all, uh, but were applied uh, in Scott County. I had mentioned uh, the, the uh, value of using community health workers and uh, mobile technology uh, is what we're doing right now to address issues of infant mortality in, um, in the Muncie area as well as in uh, the city of Indianapolis here. Uh, there is much more opportunity, I think, uh, than what we have done uh, so far. Uh, and in fact, our university is very deliberately trying to look uh, through CTSI at what is happening globally and looking for ways to apply that uh, more uh, back home here. So I, and CTSI, Notre Dame, and Purdue, and Indiana University all working together here. Uh, in addition, of course, it's not just a question of bringing lessons home back here. It's uh, taking uh, this model of uh, AMPATH, if you will, and uh, replicating those lessons or, or uh, scaling those lessons within Kenya, affecting health policy there, uh, and affecting health policy in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the, the continent of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, I still, though, believe that uh, the single greatest 
uh, effect is going to be on uh, leadership development and how, you know, in many ways, medicine's just the medium for what we do, right? What we do transcends medicine. And I think that's probably the biggest effect, and that will uh, come home to hit us uh, in a positive way uh, in our homes and in our communities. Yeah. Did you want to add anything? You just add that in many other countries that we um, consider disadvantaged, they do have a framework of primary care and access to care for all. Even though they can't always deliver on it, I think those goals and objectives are useful to bring back here from that work as well. You know, you raise a really good point. I talked about the population health initiative that we're doing. Of course, here, when one thinks population health, one thinks of who's coming in the doors of the hospital, whereas over there, we have the, the, the it's a privilege almost, of, of thinking of the population as a whole. And just that paradigm, and to take that paradigm to say, you know, me working, you know, I work as a physician at Eskenazi. Uh, you know, to say that it is not just the people that come in our door, but in fact, it is the people in the community as a whole, and that is my target. That's my definition of population health. Yeah. That is a paradigm shift for many people, and I think to see it and to see it work well in a place like Kenya makes one a believer that we can do that here in the United States. It's going to be hard. <laughs> Can't do it right now. We've got to have to do some political changes, but uh, it can happen. So another question from the audience is, what is IU and Purdue doing uh, to impact global health? So we talk, we've talked a little bit about AMPATH. I, I, will, I will say from the Purdue standpoint, um, we have many people who are trying to develop new diagnostics, kind of things like Emily described, uh, non-invasive ones that are point of care, that are really you know, absolutely required. And they're not absolutely required only in places like Bangladesh or India, they're required here in Indiana, everywhere, really. Uh, so that's one of the things. Uh, we have a lot going on in terms of drug discovery. Uh, we have some, some new uh, things coming out in, in terms of malaria control. Um, I think another point, and it goes back to the statement I made earlier, um, we have two winners of the World Food Prize, and World, uh, uh, world Food and World Water security are really important, and those are also being uh, investigated at Purdue. So, yeah. uh, and as well at Purdue in agriculture, you've got uh, those looking at uh, safe storage of grain, a remarkable discovery uh, that's uh, being uh, applied uh, throughout much of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the School of Pharmacy um, participating in uh, our program and in programs in Namibia and other, work, and other places, uh, helping to bring uh, those programs up uh, in those other countries. Um, Notre Dame, you didn't mention Notre Dame there, but since it's part of the CTSI, Notre Dame uh, investigator there uh, having come up with a uh, technology to uh, detect counterfeit detection, uh, counterfeit drugs, uh, so a counterfeit detection uh, system that, that can be used in the field. Uh, and uh, relatively uh, quickly and with uh, good um, uh, validity and uh, reliability. So these are uh, some of the things. So Bob mentioned CTSI, that's the Clinical Translational and Sciences Institute, and it's funded by the National Institutes of Health. And Indiana has had one in which partner universities, Notre Dame, Indiana University at Bloomington, Purdue University, and really headquartered here in Indianapolis with the IU Medical School, um, and, and partnering also with, with companies, has really um, established a well-recognized and uh, idolized, really, uh, CTSI for bringing translation into the clinic. And I think it has impacts on, on all of the areas that we're talking about. And I'll just say, I may, maybe I shouldn't publicly say it, um, but there is a renewal um, that will be funded unless they cut the government completely, um, that um, uh, the CTSI from Indiana got a perfect score. So I'd like to congratulate and, my colleagues. And global, and global Health was, played a prom and, and bi-directional innovation played a prominent role in that application. And that was a new component yeah, of the CTSI. Component. So I think we, round of applause for our Thank colleagues. You. Good for you and Purdue. One last pressing question. Um, 
I would like, I see here that you talked about metrics of how academic uh, work has been translated into results. Can you expand on this in general? If we were to look at academic research and with potential then for commercialization or other ways, of what would be the metrics that you would be looking at? Well, that's a really <laughs> difficult question because I think it depends on the nature, if you will, the design of the program or the design of the engagement of the, inst of the academic institution in whatever field you're talking about. And in some ways that was if, one of my major points that uh, from the very outset one needs to think about how does the output of research affect the outcome of the population. And I think it, it, and that's not a job for a researcher, that's a job for the leadership of the institution uh, to make a very deliberate decision about how they relate, uh, they, the institution relates to its, insti to its uh, community. Um, yeah. All right, your metric has to measure where you think you wanna go. And so I agree, like what, where do you want to go and, and what does that look like? And what are the interim steps to get there? And I think we can design good metrics, but I think the first barrier is often deciding where you want to go and what that looks like. I, I think each of the universities that we represent have a different model than the model that existed 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, the model now is what's your impact and that means taking basic discovery and moving it out and impacting people in the world. And so I, I think there is cultural changes within our universities, within the administrations within those universities uh, to, to, to move faculty in those directions. And importantly, I think we are always looking for partners in companies and other organizations. And so with that, I'd like to thank our, um, thank our speakers today. Yeah. Thank you.